Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Chancellor Herman, for coming also. Um, my name is Leon Dash, and I am serving as interim director of uh, the Center for Advanced Study, while my colleague, Bill Greeno, is taking a well-earned sabbatical. Now, he wrote that into my speech. <laughs> well-earned. <laughs> It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's talk, one of the center's most important annual events. As interim director, I am humbled by the tremendous roster of CAS faculty, past and present. For the past 16 years, the Center for Advanced Study has showcased the work of a CAS professor in an annual lecture. Tonight's will be given by Abigail Salyas, CAS Professor of Microbiology, the Ahrens Professor in Molecular and Cellular Biology, and Professor of Basic Medical Science. Appointment to a CAS professorship is considered to be one of the highest honors at the university that the university can bestow upon a faculty member at the Urbana-Champaign campus. Abigail was appointed to the center in 2003, and she is one of 21 current CAS professors. The center also provides fellowship, fellowships for untenured faculty and associateships for tenured faculty to provide time to devote to their research. The center's professors meet annually to review all of the applications and select the time release um, appointments. There are, also, there are always tremendously difficult decisions to make, but we finally selected 19 new associates and fellows. We were happy to welcome them into the Center for Advanced Study Community of Scholars. CAS coordinates much of interdisciplinary intellectual activities on this campus, including the prestigious CAS Millicom Lecture Series. Our next Millicom event is a lecture tomorrow, October 5th, by Mark Siegler, director of the Medical Ethics Center at the University of Chicago. The talk is Bioethical Bio Challenges in a 21st Century World, and will take place at 4 p.m. tomorrow in this room. Um, our annual initiative is Mega Disasters, Science, Policy, and Human Behavior coordinated by CAS professor and resident associate Susan Kiefer. The initiative also includes a public event series, and our next speaker is Grant Hyken, independent consultant and retired, retired geologist at Los Alamos National Laboratory, whose talk about the Bronze Age volcanic eruption is, of Thera is scheduled for Thursday October 26, 7.30 p.m. in the Knight Auditorium of the Spurlock Museum. Finally, I would like to thank the staff of the Center for Advanced Study for putting all the work they put into tonight's event. And they are Masumi Iriye, Jackie Jenkins, Nancy Sarabi, Duan Swenson, and Leah Zell Wilhagen. Before I forget, there is a reception tonight following the lecture just outside the auditorium. And I'll ask you now, after the lecture, when you have questions, please come to one of the three microphones um, you see in the aisle. It is my pleasure now to introduce Charles Miller, who will introduce tonight's distinguished speaker, Abigail Sawyers. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dash. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Abigail Sayers, who will present the 16th Annual Center for Advanced Study Lecture. For the 16 years I've spent at Illinois, Dr. Sayers has been my colleague in the Department of Microbiology, where she is currently the G. William Ahrens Professor of Microbiology and of these other things that you see on the screen here. Abigail's path to her current position was anything but direct. She received her undergraduate degree in mathematics 
from George Washington University and her PhD from the same institution in physics. The titles of the papers she published as a graduate student would seem to suggest that her interests in physics were not primarily biological. Photo disintegration of beryllium-9. Disintegration of carbon-12 into three alpha particles, although I guess it's carbon, so it's sort of biological. Isn't it? okay. After a short but apparently quite successful career teaching physics at St. Mary's College of Maryland, she was promoted to associate professor after three years, Abigail moved to the anaerobe lab at the Virginia Polytechnic Institute in Blacksburg, where after an, only an additional three years, she became an assistant professor of microbiology, a position she shortly abandoned to move in 1978 to Urbana as an assistant professor of microbiology in the College of Medicine here. I'm going to throw in an aside here for a general audience. I think it's important to point out that Abigail is one of a number of very distinguished members of the College of Medicine faculty who add greatly to the quality and reputation of the biological sciences on this campus. In the School of Molecular and Cellular Biology, for example, 20 of our 70 faculty have primary appointments in the College of Medicine. And of these, two are department heads and three hold endowed appointments. I notice on the back of our program today that in the last five years, two College of Medicine faculty members, Abigail as being the second, have been asked to deliver the Center for Advanced Study lecture. Abigail's research has been focused on the bacteroides, a major bacterial group that inhabits the mammalian gut. This anaerobic microbe is a normal constituent of the gut flora, but when it's released into the abdomen as a result of trauma, frequently trauma meaning surgical error or something like that, it can be a serious pathogen. Bacteroides species are frequently resistant to commonly used antibiotics and can act as a reservoir of antibiotic resistance, transferring resistance genes to other bacteria. Professor Salyer's work has illuminated the mechanisms by which these transfers take place. In order to carry out this work, her lab has had to develop a host of new methods. Our ability to do what can now be done in bacteroides is basically due to the work in Abigail's lab. These methods have made the bacteroides system genetically tractable and have allowed Professor Salyers and her coworkers to explore aspects of the metabolism of the organism as well as the molecular basis for antibiotic resistance and its transfer. Abigail's work has led to over 120 papers in the scientific literature as well as 60 review articles and book chapters. She is the author of, or co-author of five books. Professor Salyers has been an outstanding teacher of medical students, graduate students, and undergraduates as recognized by several awards for teaching excellence. As an outgrowth of her teaching activities, she has produced with Dixie Witt, who is sitting in the back row here, a textbook on bacterial pathogenesis that in the words of one of the leading workers in this field, quote, revolutionized the teaching of this specialty to undergraduates, graduate students, and medical students. This text represented a new and original way to organize the field and is a true scholarly contribution. It has been very widely adopted, and it's without question the leading teaching resource in the area. Professor Salyer's service contributions at the national and international levels have been truly extraordinary. She has served on many advisory groups in this country, in Europe, and in Asia. She has provided wise counsel concerning issues related to antibiotic usage and the spread of antibiotic resistance, the safety of genetically modified organisms, and various aspects of bioterrorism. She is not a member of any ideological camp and is, I believe, widely known as someone who renders her opinions based on evidence and reason rather than ideology. She has served as president of the American Society for Microbiology, the largest life sciences professional organization with over 42,000 members. Her tenure in this office coincided with the events of 2001 and 2002. I'm talking about anthrax here. And she was called upon to represent the microbiological community when the world was focused to an unprecedented degree on microbes and microbial products as weapons. She probably received a greater level of public exposure in this position than any ASM president before or since, and she acquitted herself with great distinction. This extraordinary visibility on the national and international scenes is evidenced by the fact that a Google search on Abigail's name yields over 70 pages of material, okay? And that's not because there's a rock singer or a NASCAR driver named Abigail Salyers, okay? <laughs> They're all her, okay? She must be one of this institution's best known faculty members in the public arena. Tonight, we'll present an opportunity for all of us here in this public arena to experience for ourselves the wise counsel that Abigail regularly provides for groups around the world. 
She has taken her title from that of her most recent book, Revenge of the Microbes, Are Antibiotics in Danger? It's a great pleasure to present Professor Abigail Sellers. Well, thank you all for coming here tonight and um, spending some of your time uh, hearing about a very important problem uh, that we face today. Uh, I wouldn't call it a disaster yet, but it could be considered a looming uh, disaster. And I'd like to try to give you an even-handed uh, treatment of this, of this topic that has been uh, treated not very even-handedly by many in the past. Um, so I want to start with uh, a little background here uh, to start in particular with what are antibiotics and uh, what are bacteria. Questions that I'm almost always asked when I go on the radio or other uh, uh, broadcast uh, venues to uh, explain. Now, it's important to realize, to understand, um, if you want to understand antibiotics and what a, why they were called miracle drugs and why they represented such a revolution in the treatment of human disease, uh, that they arose out of uh, conflict with an alternative uh, attempts to uh, treat human disease. And so in the, already in the 17 and 1800s, uh, in addition to attempts to uh, in introduce hygiene into hospitals uh, and to understand how diseases were, were transmitted, uh, people had already begun to try to treat them. But the basis of this treatment was uh, rather primitive and brutal, uh, what some people have called the poison principle. And the reason for that term is that uh, what people were using was uh, things that they knew were poisonous. Unfortunately, they were poisonous for humans as well as poisonous for microorganisms. And so the, uh, we see the uh, medical use of such compounds as arsenic and mercury, and in fact, uh, one of the uh, main uh, therapies for, for syphilis, which uh, was raging through uh, Europe during those years, uh, was to smear the patient with a mercury paste and then put the patient in a little hut that was heated with uh, logs fire uh, on fire and uh, sweat, them, uh, sweat the mercury into their system. Now, as you can imagine, this was a uh, frequently fatal type of treatment. It was certainly unpleasant. Um, for those people who survived it, and unfortunately, it didn't work very well or at all. Um, so this is the poison principle, and uh, people g give you an idea of how desperate people were to cure diseases at the time that were uh, potentially uh, fatal. And uh, arsenic, uh, various types of arsenical compounds were also used, uh, usually orally, uh, during that same time period. Now, in the 1900s, in the early 1900s, uh, starting around in the 30s and uh, culminating in the 40s uh, with the introduction of penicillin and streptomycin, there was a new principle that was elucidated, uh, oddly enough, by people who were mainly trained in the, in the study of soil microbes, and this, this was the idea of differential toxicity. So instead of having something that was a poison to humans, you tried to find a compound that was poisonous to the microbes, bacteria uh, specifically, um, and not poisonous to the person who had the disease. Now by that time, they had the, uh, scientists had the advantage of knowing that uh, many diseases were caused uh, by bacteria, uh, diseases like tuberculosis, bubonic plague, uh, cholera, uh, diseases that had been much dreaded and uh, were uh, often fatal. And so uh, they were able to use that insight to try to find compounds that were more toxic for the bacteria than for humans. And so this is why uh, I'm calling them the gent gentle cures, uh, because uh, although so, uh, we know, all know that now that antibiotics have some side effects, uh, by comparison to arsenic and mercury, uh, they are uh, very, very gentle cures. Incidentally, uh, for those of you who like historical uh, notes, uh, supposedly there was a joke that was told back in the 17 uh, and 1800s um, about uh, Greek uh, Roman mythology. The question was, what do you know about Roman mythology? And the answer was, uh, a night with Venus means a month with Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether that's apocryphal or not. It's one of those things that a story like that 
Uh, you just don't go back and research it because you might find out it's not true. <laughs> All right, so differential toxicity had its triumph uh, with the introduction of such drugs as penicillin and streptomycin. Now, another way to, to get uh, an appreciation for how important that introduction was, uh, even in, in modern times, is that the New York Times, about uh, a little less than 10 years ago, uh, published a very large uh, obituary notice on a woman that no one had ever heard of, Ann Miller, who was the first, no relationship to Charles Miller, I think, uh, but anyway, she was the first person, the first civilian to be cured of uh, bacterial pneumonia with penicillin, and that was considered to be such a landmark in the history of modern medicine that uh, the New York Times recognized, she survived then, uh, something that people normally died of, and lived to a ripe old age. Now, an interesting uh, feature of antibiotics is that many of them are natural products of soil bacteria. I just mentioned that many of the people who were uh, responsible for these early antibiotics were uh, actually soil microbiologists rather than medical microbiologists and had this almost uh, uh, religious awe of the uh, curative properties of soil. And so this was an, uh, one of the first examples where they uh, were able to, to put that into practice. Now, so what are antibiotics? Well, antibiotics are chemicals uh, that kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria, and these are generally classified into two groups, the so-called bactericidal uh, antibiotics, the ones that kill bacteria, or the bacteriostatic uh, ones that just inhibit the bacterial growth in the body. Now, I mention this because you might, uh, it gives you an indication of how antibiotics actually uh, work with uh, the patient uh, in, in the cure of bacterial diseases because uh, you might wonder why a bacteriostatic antibiotic would be desirable since it doesn't kill the bacteria outright. And the answer is that if you have a healthy defense system, uh, you have healthy white cells that go around and gobble up bacteria, that they may have been outclassed by the bacteria temporarily, but if you can just uh, slow the uh, growth of the bacteria uh, long enough to give your white cells a chance to come in and, and uh, take care of the disease, you can survive. And so, uh, as, I, as I said, we see here an example of, back, of, of antibiotics actually uh, working with the patient as opposed to just targeting the bacteria. Uh, also, antibiotics uh, are characterized by the fact that they have uh, specific bacterial targets. And what that means is that they target uh, specific features of the bacteria. Now, I'll come back to this in a minute, but bacteria, most of them have a very uh, rigid cell wall, which is essential for their survival. Without it, if it's compromised, uh, they will explode, and it's kind of hard to come back from exploding, uh, as Humpty Dumpty found out. Um, but this, uh, so uh, antibiotics like penicillin, for example, that, that uh, interfere with the formation of this rigid cell wall uh, are uh, able to kill bacteria. But there are also antibiotics that, that stop the synthesis of proteins or DNA by bacteria. Now, bacteria synthesize proteins and DNA uh, much the same way we do, but the uh, proteins that are involved in that process are different enough that you can use this uh, differential toxicity to target compounds that, that hit the bacterial process rather than the human uh, process. And then there are other aspects of bacterial metabolism that for lack of time I won't go into, but anyway, these are specific targets. Now, by contrast, uh, disinfectants and antiseptics tend to be compounds that have a very general effect. Uh, they are uh, have a lot of effects on bacteria, and the result of, of which they are usually not safe enough to be used internally, uh, and so you will see these in topical creams or used to cleanse uh, an environmental setting. Okay, I, I want to emphasize this once again, the point that I've already made, that they're more toxic, the, bacteria, the antibiotics are more toxic for them than for us. And another obvious uh, thing to, that I'm going to underline here, and I'll explain why in just a moment, is that they uh, actually cure diseases. Now, we have a lot of medical treatments today that will ameliorate uh, the effects of a disease, it will suppress the symptoms, uh, but in, in the case of antibiotics, you have a cure. All right, so, um, and I'll come back to that point in a moment as well. All right, so what are antibiotics for? And the reason I want to talk about this for a few minutes is that uh, I think sometimes people fail to appreciate uh, the importance of antibiotics because they don't really think of all the ways in which antibiotics are important to us, but what I'm going to try to convince you of is that antibiotics and the effectiveness of antibiotics underlies 
the uh, successes, many of the successes of modern medicine, even ones that may seem to not to be directly dependent upon them. So the first uh, answer that most people will give to the question of why are antibiotics important is the first one, that they cure life-threatening infectious diseases, uh, not only old, element, old enemies such as tuberculosis, plague, syphilis, and so forth, uh, but new en enemies such as the so-called opportunistic infections. Now, uh, as Charles mentioned, I work on a bacterium that's called an opportunist, and what that means is that normally uh, it's found in very high numbers in your intestines. So all of you carry uh, billions and billions of this uh, bacteroides in your intestinal tract along with uh, many other types of bacteria, and they're normally either innocuous or actually beneficial. But if they get out of the uh, area in which they're supposed to be contained, then they can wreak havoc. And so when you, uh, an opportunistic infection is something like a post-surgical infection where the intervention of surgery, or it could be trauma from an automobile accident or some other kind of wound, uh, breaches the defenses of the body and allows these bacteria to get into the wrong place, you can have uh, a problem, a real problem. So bacteria, this type of bacteria is sort of like uh, the definition of a weed, which has often been called a flower in the wrong place. And uh, th these opportunist, uh, opportunistic infections are caused by bacteria that find themselves in the wrong place. Now, in addition to, cu to curing life-threatening infections, uh, antibiotics also can uh, improve the quality of life. So there are a lot of conditions, and I've listed some here, that are not necessarily life-threatening, but are uh, very unpleasant. And so uh, antibiotics are used to uh, try to help people to uh, lessen people's suffering, um, even if their life is not at stake. Um, acne, as many of you know, uh, are, uh, is uh, treated with antibiotics, and uh, that this is a good example of a case where antibiotics are uh, able to uh, not so much cure the disease outright, but to uh, postpone its effects and uh, eventually let you grow out of it. Gastric ulcers is another one that has recently uh, been put on this list. Um, for a long time, people thought that gastric ulcers were caused by overproduction of acid in the stomach, and that does contribute. But the finding that gastric ulcers were caused by a type of bacterium called Helicobacter pylori, uh, we have someone in our department uh, who, who works on that, and uh, the, this has become a big area of research right now. But finding out that this disease was caused by bacteria uh, was a revolution because it said that now you could cure gastric ulcers rather than, so rather than taking a, 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 a drug like Tagamet for the rest of your life and still getting ulcers, you could take a short uh, course of antibiotics and be cured of the disease. Now this revolution, which has been fairly recently accepted, has spawned a, a, almost a gold rush of people looking again at other conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, which is a very unpleasant uh, uh, kind of disease that many people have, arthritis, some forms of heart disease. I didn't go into the whole list. Alzheimer's has even been uh, looked at in this connection. And it's not that people necessarily have a reason to think that these diseases are caused by bacteria, but they uh, hope that they can find a bacterium that causes the disease because, as with gastric ulcers, they could then cure it. And uh, a number of years ago, I was asked to come to talk to the Colitis and Crohn's Disease Foundation meeting about, the, this is inflammatory bowel disease group. And uh, I said, well, I don't work on colitis and Crohn's disease. What do you want me to talk about? And they said, we want you to come and tell us how we can find out our diseases are caused by bacteria. And so I said, well, maybe, it's, maybe they're caused by a virus or uh, something else. And I, well, we don't want to hear that because we, uh, bacterial uh, antibiotics have been by far the most the most successful uh, curative compounds. So there's a lot of this going on. Now, some aspects of antibiotics that often uh, escape most the average person's notice are shown here. Um, surgery was, has been known since the time of the Egyptians. And uh, during the 1800s, uh, surgery became quite sophisticated. The only problem with surgery as a, as a uh, remedy for anything was that overwhelming bacterial infections that resulted from uh, contamination of the surgical wounds often killed the patient. So this is the origin of the, of the statement that the, the patient was cured, uh, the, the disease was cured, but the patient died 
uh, and that was unfortunately an outcome of, of early surgery. Now, because of the antibiotics, uh, you, can, you can make surgery relatively risk-free. In the case of cancer chemotherapy, uh, most forms of cancer chemotherapy have the effect of lowering your white cell count. These, again, are the cells that uh, go around and, and uh, destroy bacteria that might get into your bloodstream or tissue. And uh, this is a transient uh, reduction in the number of the white cells, but it can be deadly to you because cancer patients, uh, it makes cancer patients more susceptible to various types of bacterial infections. And so frequently, especially in cases of aggressive cancer chemotherapy, surgeons will uh, treat their, uh, ask their patients to take antibiotics um, in order to try to prevent them from, from being uh, infected uh, during the period when they're at, at risk. Now, here's a topic that I wouldn't have brought up until very recently, um, but I want to say something about it. Uh, one of the first uh, successes of penicillin was in the treatment of uh, wartime wounds. Uh, prior to World War II, as most of you know, uh, wound infections were by far the most common cause of death, uh, more, much more common than the, the death d directly due to the trauma of the wound itself, and it was also a major cause of amputations. Now, with the advent of World War II and penicillin, uh, suddenly uh, this, this balance changed and wound infections gradually became less of a problem for the military. Uh, and in fact, there's a famous poster from the period, of, from the World War II period, uh, the slogan of which is, uh, he'll come home uh, thanks to penicillin. Now, uh, between World War II and the current Iraq War, we haven't, uh, there have been infections uh, as a problem for, uh, for the military, but uh, it's only in the Iraq War that we're starting to, people are starting to worry about this wound infection problem uh, coming back. And the reason is, uh, in this case, it's a bacterium called Acinetobacter. It's a soil bacterium, and many of the uh, wounded uh, uh, veterans from the Iraq War who come to Walter Reed Hospital are colonized or infected with this bacterium. Uh, the problem there is that it's so-called pan-resistant bacterium. That means that it's a bacterium, uh, one of the increasing number, that is resistant to virtually all antibiotics. Now, so far, the news is good. There haven't been uh, any deaths, I don't, I don't think. There have been a number of serious infections, but there haven't been any deaths due to Acinetobacter. But there's concern uh, that in the future this might prove to be a real problem once again, so we would go back to the old uh, problem with, with uh, wound infections uh, killing soldiers. Uh, still another area that you may have read about in the newspaper, but I uh, want to mention anyway, is that uh, antibiotics are not only used in human medicine, but also to improve agricultural productivity. Now, if you stop to think about it, uh, one of the reasons that productivity, agricultural productivity is so high in the developed countries is that you can have these crowded populations of animals or, or plants or fish, um, and they don't all die of uh, epidemic infections. And so uh, in the animal husbandry industry, especially with chickens and pigs, but to a lesser extent with, uh, with cattle, um, the prevention of disease in crowded animal populations is an important uh, regular uh, use of uh, antibiotics or application of antibiotics. Also, there is this mysterious phenomenon known as growth promotion in which the animal doesn't necessarily grow larger than it would have, but it grows faster, um, and this is attributable to certain antibiotics like tetracycline. Now, no one has ever bothered to find out what the mechanism of this is. I think some of the pharmaceutical com companies are looking now, but uh, this very small increase in growth, usually about 4%, uh, is critical to farmers who run these large animal uh, factory farms. Uh, fruit trees in the Midwest are uh, sprayed with antibiotics, um, and this prevents a disease called fire blight uh, that is, uh, can destroy an orchard in pretty short order. Most recently, aquaculture has jumped on the bandwagon of antibiotic, widespread antibiotic use uh, because, again, you have these crowded populations of fish, and you, in order to keep all the fish from dying, uh, people will use um, antibiotics. This is also uh, widely used in shrimp farming and other kinds of, of uh, aquaculture. 
Okay, so uh, this is, you can see how many ways back to, uh, antibiotics pervade uh, our well-being and our, our health. Um, and so uh, losing antibiotics is not, would be a very bad thing. And uh, so I'd like to spend a few minutes now uh, talking about the answering the second question that usually comes up in case of uh, antibiotics and bacteria is, well, what are bacteria? Um, so uh, there are some of you in the audience, I know, that I know the answer to this already, but let me just uh, spend some time uh, very briefly describing their features. Um, these are microscopic organisms that reproduce, most of them reproduce by dividing. And an important feature of them is, is that many of them can divide uh, once every hour or less. So you go from one to two, from two to four, and so on, and you can achieve extremely high concentrations of bacteria if the conditions are right in a very short period of time. Anyone who's ever had a urinary tract infection has experienced this problem. Uh, meningitis is another case of a disease where this rapid division uh, causes the bacteria to take over very quickly, and they just overwhelm the body's uh, defenses. Now, this uh, ability to divide uh, frequently also gives the bacteria another advantage. It allows them to throw the genetic dice repeatedly um, and the, uh, by mutation uh, produce progeny that may be selected uh, for various uh, traits such as resistance to antibiotics. Bacterial numbers in nature are very high. Uh, people tend to get... Uh, uh, become alarmed when they read a, an article that says that there are bacteria on light switches. Well, um, the number of bacteria on light switches is very small, but the number of bacteria in your intestinal tract is huge. About a third of the contents of your colon is bacteria. And so we live normally with these very high concentrations of bacteria. You also have bacteria in your mouth, on your skin, on the vaginal tract. Uh, and then out in nature, uh, concentrations of bacteria are very high. A point I'll come back to shortly because it's uh, it, we got to live learn to live with them uh, because we're not going to we're not going to get rid of them. Normally, these bacteria are excluded from human tissue, blood, and organs, and this is because over human evolution we have evolved to uh, to protect our internal organs, our blood and tissue from all this huge population of bacteria that we're constantly exposed to. And I don't have time to talk about this. This is really rather remarkable, the way the body has evolved. This is one of the little appreciated aspects of human evolution. And the, uh, it's almost as if bacteria designed a lot of aspects of human uh, physiology and anatomy uh, due to selection pressure. Now, another feature of bacteria that most people don't appreciate is that most of these bacteria in nature, fortunately for us, are harmless or actually helpful to us. Now, to make oh. So uh, another feature of bacteria, because that, what I've told you doesn't really tell you much about what, what, well, what are they. Um, I mentioned that they have rigid cell walls usually that help them to maintain their shape and structural integrity, uh, and also that this is the target of penicillins and also a new drug called vancomycin. And they usually have very simple shapes. Uh, and this is quite misleading. So let's take a look at some bacteria. So here are a couple of cases of dividing bacteria. Here's two over here. Here's one bacterium that's in the process of becoming two. This is a large human cell here in the background. This is a cross-section of one of these bacteria. Um, and over here are some others that happen to be, have a more uh, spherical shape. This has been colorized, incidentally. They don't really look like this under the microscope. Now, people look at something like that, and they say, well, what's the big deal? We've got a couple of hot dogs here and, a, and maybe a couple of lima beans. You know, what's, what's the problem with that? Well, it turns out that these, that these bacteria, uh, most of them have compounds in, their rigid, in that rigid cell wall I mentioned that when they uh, are released into your blood or tissue can provoke a, an intense inflammatory response that causes a form of shock called septic shock, and that's what kills you when you have uh, the misfortune to have bacteria, in, in, even in fairly low numbers, in your bloodstream or spinal fluid, um, and that's, that's what kills you. Now, some of these bacteria also produce uh, toxic proteins in addition. So even though they look rather innocuous, I mean, what kid would want to go out dressed as a bacterium on Halloween? I mean, nobody would be scared. Um, <laughs> but they, they are deceptively uh, uh, simple and innocuous looking, but they can, as I mentioned, be, uh, in some cases, if in the wrong place, very dangerous. Uh, a second thing to, uh, to t keep in mind, though, which is perhaps more important, is that the this, this simple shape is deceptive uh, because it makes it sound, or makes it appear that they're not very complicated. 
And in fact, bacteria are extremely diverse. It's their, they're by far the most diverse form of life on Earth, much more diverse than insects. But it's all in their metabolism. Uh, and just the fact that back to their bacteria that can live in sulfuric acid, bacteria that live at the bottom of the ocean, uh, bacteria that live inside of insects, uh, all sorts of places uh, gives you an idea of that diversity. But I want to make that point uh, even uh, more uh, firmly because this is also a clue to why bacteria have so quickly and easily become resistant to antibiotics. So here's the sh uh, short version of the history of life on Earth. I got this slide from a uh, modification of a slide I got from Carl Woese, who's here at the University of Illinois. Um, so let's go through this very quickly. Let's fast forward here. The Earth's crust cools, and very quickly, uh, organisms about, that include bacteria and a group of archaea, uh, called archaea, which are also very, sort of like bacteria in some ways, uh, discovered here at the University of Illinois, incidentally, uh, appear back very quickly after the Earth's crust cooled. Um, and then a little later, the eukaryotic microbes, which are the ones uh, like us, uh, cells are like, more like ours, appeared. Now, up to this point, there was no uh, oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere, but a group of bacteria called cyanobacteria began to introduce uh, significant amounts of oxygen into the Earth's atmosphere, and this allowed not only introduced oxygen to make the oxygen uh, breathing organisms possible, but also uh, form the, um, uh, the uh, layer, the ozone layer that protects us from radiation and allowed life to move out of the oceans and onto the land. Okay, so here's, here bacteria are uh, man's best friend of the microbial world. I have to mention that there are some cyanobacteria that produce toxic substances too, but you can't have everything, I guess. So they gave us oxygen. And later, these bacteria went on to become the uh, organelles of plants that perform photosynthesis. Um, anyway, so they, here, here we keep going along and along. And only finally, very recently in history, do the visible plants and animals begin to appear. So if you want to think of it this way, we were born into their world. This is a world that was dominated by bacteria and archaea and, the, and by very simple eukaryotic microbes for billions of years until we came along. Now, when we came along, bacteria were very excited about that, if you can think of a bacterium becoming excited, uh, because we were new opportunities for, uh, for colonization and for food. And so, as I sometimes say to students, that the philosophers and theologians may tell you that humans are the crown of creation, but as far as bacteria are concerned, we're just a free lunch. And so they have, and they uh, have, have uh, taken advantage of us, but they have done so, for the most part, in a fairly gentle way. We provide them food, and they don't kill us. Okay, so it's a hostage, it's a, we're, it's a hostage situation, folks. But it's one that usually has a good outcome. All right, now the point of, of this is that all through this period, if, you've, if you heard geologists talk, there were all sorts of catastrophes, asteroids hitting the Earth, volcanic action, uh, huge storms, uh, and here come along the little microbes just uh, hanging in there. And so when uh, we come up with antibiotics, which wouldn't even, would barely be at the zero stage here, uh, they weren't very impressed. This is, a, this is a very minor irritation to them compared to what they had gone through before. And so it's not too surprising that uh, these, and, and so they had become, a, they were able to adapt to all these different, not just places on the earth, but the changing uh, challenges and it's no surprise that they uh, were able to adapt uh, to antibiotics uh, and are adapting all too quickly. Okay, so an appreciation of this, I think, is important. Also, uh, something you should appreciate is that besides our friends, the cyanobacteria that made our, our life possible by introducing the first oxygen into the atmosphere, all along here, these bacteria were uh, uh, practicing recycling and making, uh, making it possible on, for, in another way for life to exist on Earth. So we're absolutely dependent on bacteria and archaea, particularly uh, for life uh, on Earth. And so uh, that's another reason, if, even if we could get rid of them, which we can't, fortunately, uh, we wouldn't want to. So bacteria generally are friends. Uh, it's just a few of them that give the whole group a bad name. Oops. All right, so got a heavy trigger, trigger finger here. All right, so the, um, I just thought I'd uh, mention this to make the point that if you have these organisms that are so ancient and have been uh, around uh, uh, th going through a lot of things for such a long time, 
it's not too surprising that they're very, very diverse. And so what this is, is Carl Bose here at the University of Illinois revolutionized all of biology, not just microbiology, by deciding that instead of using shape uh, and appearance as a, as a uh, metric for deciding what was related to some, what else and what was diverse and what wasn't, he used a uh, DNA sequence marker and uh, used, and this is the tree of life that he, that he produced from that. So this is like a genealogical chart that humans make, except this is, this is a bacteria, the archaea, and here's the eukarya, that's us and others, uh, others like us. Okay, so look at this. The animals, fungi, humans, insects are in here. Uh, not very uh, diverse organisms compared to all these microbes that are, uh, have enormous uh, genetic and metabolic diversity. And that's not surprising in view of the uh, history of life on Earth that I told you about. So this is something that we're just beginning to appreciate. And aside, so this is also a challenge for antibiotics, however, because there, if you think about all these bacteria, just even just in the bacterial world and the tremendous diversity there, you can imagine that it gets, uh, fortunately, we only have to deal with a small portion of them. But uh, def def uh, finding new antibiotics is not as trivial as it might first sound. OK, so now let me get to the topic of the, of the lecture after that long preamble and uh, talk to you about resistance to antibiotics. All right, so if you were an enterprising little bacterium and you had uh, had it good, you had these humans to live on, plants to live on, and along comes uh, these inconsiderate humans decide to throw antibiotics into the equation, what, what would you do? Well, the bacteria very quickly came up with several strategies uh, for dealing with antibiotics. Uh, some of them will inactivate the antibiotic, um, so, that, so basically uh, destroy the ability of the antibiotic to act. They can deny access of the antibiotic uh, to its target, uh, or they can mutate the target of the antibiotic, uh, the bacterial target of the antibiotic, so that the antibiotic no longer binds to that target and kills or uh, inhibits the growth of the bacterium. So these are some of the main ways, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's some of the main ways that bacteria, uh, or that, uh, bacteria have responded to antibiotics. And the diversity of these responses is another indication of their diversity uh, of uh, metabolic uh, activities and genetic capacity. Now I'm going to come back to this because I'm going to use uh, this, this first, our understanding of this first type of resistance in a moment to show you how scientists are, are fighting back. But before I do that, I want to talk about the public reaction to the resistance threat. Now, after uh, hearing about the importance of antibiotics, for uh, the uh, eff efficacy of which underlies most of modern medicine, you can begin to get the picture that losing antibiotics would not be a good idea. And uh, this is, moreover, uh, there's a psychological effect that has been little uh, considered, and that is that although we have failed to cure a number of diseases, we have never lost a cure. And so the loss of antibiotics to bacterial resistance uh, could be a first, a bad kind of first, in uh, modern medicine. And nobody knows what the psychological consequences of that might be. OK, so there have been two types of responses to this. The first I'm uh, characterizing here is hysteria. Um, and what you, the, the most common form of this you see is that we are all in danger of returning to the pre-antibiotic era, the bad old days when you were treating people with syphilis with mercury or you were having uh, surgery become uh, very seldom, much more seldom used because of danger uh, to the patient of overwhelming infections. Cancer chemotherapy goes out the window. The scenario just goes on and on. And then there's the reasoned approach. Now, I'll come back to this in a minute, but since hysteria is more fun than the reasoned approach, come on, we're, we're all weak, human. Uh, beings, uh, I'm going to do hysteria first, and then you know, you, uh, uh, then I'll have to disappoint you with the reasoned approach. But of course, the reasoned approach is the one that's more likely to actually be useful to us. Okay, now here's uh, a particularly graphic form of hysteria, and so for those of you who may not be able to see this very well, this is the cover of a usually very sedate journal called Science, very famous, uh, prestigious journal. But science, in its, in, uh, in its infinite wisdom, decided to have this picture on its cover. So this is a diptych. One side is this painting from Bruegel. And this is the painting of the, uh, from the plague year. So here's, here we have, if you can see, the, there's the, uh, horse, some of the horsemen of the apocalypse. There are some 
dead people going wherever dead people went at that time. There are a few skeletons thrown in here. You know, it's, it's the, the, the plague, I mean, it's bubonic plague, all right. Now, on the other side, however, so this isn't enough. On the other side, there's a, there's a painting by a modern artist shown here where you see an inner city uh, depicted, an inner city setting depicted uh, where there are not only skeletons uh, loitering around, and surely that's against the law, uh, but <laughs> there are skeletons uh, with their arms around uh, living, still living human beings. Now, if, if I were a human being and a skeleton came up and put its arm around me, wouldn't you notice? I mean, but here's somebody standing here just as if nothing's happening. And so this is a pretty horrific idea. Here's this ambulance going by and this, all this whatever is going on in the, in the distance there. This is antibiotic resistance as depicted by science. Now, so I call this hysteria. Um, and also, but here's the problem with hysteria. Hysteria is fun uh, up to a point. But notice that this cover was from 1992. Now, after this cover, uh, science has never had another cover on antibiotic resistance. It's published papers on antibiotic resistance, but it really hasn't paid this much attention to it. And this is the trouble with hysteria, is that it takes a lot of energy, and people uh, tend to get tired of it pretty quickly. All right, so here's hysteria. And let me uh, go to the hysteria scenario. Uh, could we return to a pre-antibiotic era? Now, I'm going to argue that the short answer to that is, is probably not. Uh, and the reason is that um, we may be dumb in a lot of ways, but we've learned a lot during the last century. OK, so we've, we've learned to take seriously some old lessons we almost forgot. And uh, one of those old lessons is sanitation, hygiene. Now, if I'd been really ghoulish and cynical back in the uh, uses of antibiotics, I could have put down uh, being able to fire the janitor because you don't need to worry about hygiene in the hospitals, uh, but I decided not to put that in there in, in previous slides. Uh, so uh, some of our hospitals have become very remiss in their, in their cleanliness. Um, we, could also, we also know that isolating patients, now we know how, how bacteria, how, how diseases are caused, we can isolate patients uh, with, that are infected with bacteria that are resistant to uh, antibiotics. And this is actually being done in some settings, there was a big outbreak of drug-resistant tuberculosis in New York City not too long ago, and uh, they were forced to go to isolation of patients. Very expensive process. Uh, also, uh, we could try to uh, use antibiotics more rationally. What a concept. Now, but there has, we also have learned some new things during the last century, um, and one of these is laser surgery, uh, which reduces the uh, the need for these big gashes and, uh, sur during surgery, and thus would reduce the opportunity for bacteria to cause infection. People are also developing the so-called smart cancer drugs, which uh, reduce the, the uh, um, temporary destruction of the white cells. And as I'm going to tell you now, that we have some new ways of countering uh, antibacterial resistance strategies. Okay, so before I go to that, let me just take you quickly through the reasoned approach. And I mention this because a lot of questions that I'm asked about antibiotic use uh, come up around these first two, well, especially this first point. Um, people need to get, we all need to get to, to be better at doing uh, for ourselves uh, and our families a, a rational risk-benefit analysis. Now, I was on the radio yesterday and, and a uh, caller called in, which I, I was very grateful for this question and was asking me about the fact that women who have been found to have a certain type of bacterium in their vaginal tract uh, called group B streptococci are uh, frequently asked to take antibiotics uh, to try to reduce the load of that bacterium or eliminate it entirely. And the reason is that when the baby comes through the birth canal and gets those bacteria that uh, meningitis can be the result. And group B streptococci are a major cause of infant meningitis. Um, and so the patient, the person was asking me, well, is, should we do this because it, it will in, uh, increase, uh, and possibly increase antibiotic resistance. So here's a case where the benefit is so great that the risk of resistance, uh, increasing resistance is outweighed. By contrast, taking antibiotics for a viral disease like the flu or a cold where the antibiotics have no effect is uh, not, uh, the, there the benefit is zero and the risk of resistance is high. Now, I'm not going to say much about this, but uh, regulatory and other health officials are trying to promote a rational science-based approach. And I guess the best example of where you might say, well, of course, that's, isn't that what they do? 
Um, but in, for example, trying to formulate uh, rules for uh, or uh, guidelines for agricultural use of antibiotics, uh, there's been a lot of non-rational, non-science-based uh, uh, argument going on, and uh, this is something that the that the regulatory agencies are constantly battling. And uh, one of the things we could do is to support a science-based approach, uh, a, acknowledging that science is not is not perfect. And finally, we can take advantage of scientific advances. And since this is the kind of thing that I and my colleagues uh, work on, I'd like to say something more about this. Okay, so how are we going to combat resistance uh, using science-based, uh, using uh, new scientific discoveries? Well, the obvious, one obvious way is let's find some new antibiotics. If bacteria become resistant to A, let's find B. And then if they become resistant to B, let's find C. So we just keep one step ahead of them. Um, we could say, uh, we could neutralize bacterial resistance strategies, that is, combat the resistance strategy itself, uh, and we could also figure out ways to prevent the spread of resistance. Well, let me go through those one by one. Uh, finding new antibiotics. Now, here's the problem. Um, antibiotics have been too successful. So, uh, it, it costs about as much to bring a new antibiotic to market as it does to bring a drug like Lipitor or Prozac to market. But the pharmaceutical companies make a lot more money off uh, drugs like Prozac. And I can assure you that the human brain is not going to become resistant to Prozac anytime soon. And so they've got this drug until it goes off patent. Um, so the pharmaceutical companies, just responding to economic realities, have been quietly shutting down uh, or uh, shutting, scaling back on their antibiotic discovery programs. Also, it's become harder to find new antibiotics. We found a lot of antibiotics easily at the beginning, but finding newer ones uh, has proven to be difficult. And it's not clear why that's, the, why that's the case, possibly because we keep looking for new antibiotics using the same old way we found the old ones, and uh, that's not a good, a good strategy. Uh, also, for reasons that are not clear, the new technology, uh, things like combinatorial chemistry and genomics, has not been providing the miracles of, of discovery that we expected. Now, maybe this is early days to be complaining about that. Uh, people may, maybe were unrealistic in expecting that we would get miracles from these new technologies. Uh, and it may take a while for us to, for those technologies to mature and yield uh, good results. But so for all these reasons, finding new antibiotics is not an impossible uh, undertaking, but it's not nearly as easy as it was back in the 40s. OK, now, there's some possible solutions to this. And I'll just mention very briefly some things that people have talked about. There are some economic solutions, because as I mentioned, the uh, part of the problem with the pharmaceutical companies is, is an economic one. Um, and so there's the carrots and sticks uh, have been discussed in this context. Obviously, the government could try to use coercion, uh, and that's uh, not acceptable to most, most people. They could use bribery, too, I guess, but that, for a variety of reasons, is not a good idea. So they come up with more sophisticated ideas, like the so-called wildcard option, that um, gives the uh, pharmaceutical company, if the pharmaceutical company introduces a new antibiotic onto the market, that, the, uh, that they can uh, extend a patent uh, for something like Lipitor or Prozac uh, for another couple of years. So uh, this is a kind of a, of a it's a sort of bribery, but it uh, looks a little bit more respectable than actual outright bribery. Uh, also, the uh, National Institutes of Health, which had not been particularly interested in drug discovery or antibiotic resistance until recently, has now decided that maybe it would be a good idea to turn the uh, academic uh, or, or uh, tremendously talented group of, of uh, academic scientists uh, loose on this problem. And so where when I uh, often serve on grant evaluation panels at, at the National Institutes of Health. And it used to be that if you came forward with a proposal to find a new antibiotic, you would get the two thumbs down immediately because, of course, the pharmaceutical uh, industry did that. So now there's that, uh, that, that attitude that's changed uh, and may help, uh, but it's only changed recently. Now, the scientists are doing something a little different, and they're going after the antibiotic uh, resistance strategy. So this is the second topic here. Uh, and i just give you an example of this that has uh, got a lot of people excited. It's unfortunately the only example right now that, has, that is actually on the market. Uh, normally, I don't give the name of the drug, but I will in this case augmentin. I don't have any augmentin stock or anything, but uh, some people like to know if they've been taking this, what, what it is. Now, uh, amoxicillin is an antibiotic uh, of the penicillin family. 
Uh, and that antibiotic is sliding down the slippery slope of resistance because many bacteria have become resistant to amoxicillin, a nice uh, good old uh, workhorse of an antibiotic. And many of them become resistant because they produce enzymes that inactivate amoxicillin. So here's the idea that now you mix your amoxicillin with another chemical called clavulanic acid. And this is a, this is a compound that has no antibiotic uh, properties, but it, it attacks the enzyme that would kill the amoxicillin. So if you want to imagine this in one of these uh, game, gaming scenarios, the amoxicillin is a helicopter comes in, it's going to zap some bad guys. Uh, but some of the bad guys have come up with the uh, shoulder uh, held uh, rocket grenade launchers. And so they come up and they start to hit the helicopter and knock the helicopter out of the sky. Well, then you get a second kind of helicopter that comes along and uh, uh, puts a laser on the guys who have the shoulder held uh, rocket uh, propelled grenades. Uh, launchers, and uh, you, you can then uh, knock them out so that then the first helicopter can go in and do its job. All right, so this is the basic idea in bore phraseology of, of this approach. And so people are very uh, excited about that because they hope that we can do this uh, because we have a fairly good understanding of many of these bacterial resistance strategies. Maybe we could go in with the old one-two punch and hit some of these other ones. All right, so. Um, the other thing that we could try to do is prevent the spread of antibiotic resistance by understanding what pressures propel the spread of antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria. And you would think that we would know that. I mean, the simple answer to that is, well, overuse and abuse in human medicine of antibiotics. But it's becoming clear that there are other pressures, that this doesn't explain everything. OK, so we have across-the-counter sales of antibiotics in developing countries. All right, that, that is making a contribution. But it still doesn't seem to uh, account for everything. Now, one thing we've noticed that I don't have up here on the slide is that uh, antibiotics uh, seem to, some of them seem to survive for a long time in the, in the environment. So we're seeing antibiotics leaching into groundwater and into creeks and coming out of sewage treatment plants. I don't know where people got the idea that there was some kind of a magic fence around the hospital so that when the antibiotics went out of the hospital, it was flushed down the toilet of the hospital or came out by some other way, that the antibiotic was miraculously vaporized. But we now know that people did sort of assume that. And we now know that's not the case. Agricultural use of antibiotics is uh, very controversial right now. The problem here is that we've addicted our farmers to the use of antibiotics uh, because of, for economic reasons. And now uh, we can't very well ask them to go cold turkey without being pretty sure how much of a contribution this makes. So here we're get moving into the unknown zone uh, that we don't really have a good number for what percentage of, uh, if any, of, of antibiotic resistance uh, incidence is due to, to agricultural use of antibiotics. And finally, we're finding uh, un unknowns, or we suspect there are unknown selection pressures like pollution and the antibacterial products that are so popular today um, that uh, select in an indirect way, usually, for the maintenance of antibiotic resistance genes. OK, so uh, finally, um, I'd like to say something uh, about some of the uh, work that we do in my lab very briefly. Um, and that is to understand how bacteria acquire DNA from each other. Now, why would that be of interest here? Well, I mentioned mutation to resistance. Uh, and bacteria certainly do that. But it can take a bacteria. Uh, months or years to mutate, to make all the mutations that will make it resistant to an antibiotic. Um, and uh, in the process, a lot of bacteria die. Now, the alternative, which is much gentler for the bacteria, is for them to take, to acquire DNA from each other. And that acquisition uh, of the DNA is, is relatively risk-free for the bacteria because now they've got the preformed piece of DNA that, has, that tells the bacteria how to become resistant. They don't have to mutate to achieve that, uh, that blueprint. And so uh, the bacteria acquire DNA in various ways. Uh, and they can acquire this DNA from very different bacteria. So this is uh, kind of like uh, you having sex with a slug or something, because the, the acquiring DNA from something very distantly related to you. Uh, and this is a problem, because it means that we don't have some of these methods are, are tend to be uh, uh, limited to a, a single species, but many of them will cross genus and species lines. So they can take DNA up from the environment. DNA can be transferred uh, by va bacterial viruses. And then you have a process called the direct cell-to-cell -cell transfer that's called conjugation. And since 
I'll just show you one picture of this since this is one of the things we work on in my laboratory. And Steve Ferrand, who is also here, uh, works on this and uh, transfer but from bacteria to plants. Uh, conjugation is, uh, here, here's the chromosome of the bacteria down here, and there's this little extra uh, piece of DNA. And you'll notice, oh, you don't have to look at this in detail, but what's happening is that these bacteria, the, the joint, the, this bacterium here joins up with another one that doesn't have this little extra piece of DNA. And this piece of DNA starts to move, moves through, and finally, both the, the donor and recipient, so-called, have, have this segment of DNA. Now, if this DNA segment contains an antibiotic resistance gene, that's not good, uh, because this process can occur uh, within an hour. Uh, and it can, and as I said, it's fairly uh, innocuous to the bacteria that actually acquire the new piece of DNA. And so this is a, uh, an area that is of interest because uh, it's a very easy way for bacteria to spread resistance genes. And um, we want to know what propels this kind of transfer. Now, in my laboratory, we look at, and Steve also uh, looks at the at things that stimulate this kind of transfer. And one of the things that uh, we've looked at that stimulates this kind of transfer is an antibiotic tetracycline uh, actually causes this to occur. And so sometimes I put it this way, that uh, if you consider this to be bacterial sex here, uh, because it's the exchange of DNA, then tetracycline is acting like an aphrodisiac for these bacteria. All right, so uh, they've come to the end of what I wanted to cover, and I thought that you might uh, be interested, those of you who are not in, uh, in the biology departments, to see some of the people who are working in this area. I, for I forgot to put Steve Ferrand's name on this list, for which I will probably suffer the horribly and for a, and, and a prolonged manner. Sorry, Steve, about that. But the point I want to make here is that there are a couple of us in the microbiology department and in animal sciences who are actually uh, working directly on the problem of antibiotic discovery or antibiotic resistance. But there are a lot of other people, and I've mentioned some of them here, uh, who are doing things that appear to be unrelated, but in fact are very helpful as a basis for uh, aiding our research. And in fact, uh, one of the, the uh, well, two things I want to leave you with in terms of thinking about this is that, uh, in terms of thinking about discovery, is that the, it's the interaction of people from these very different areas that is critical for uh, making progress. And a second uh, thought I'd like to leave you with, and I'd like to uh, thank Charles Miller, who was our former department head, and John Cronin, our current department head, for encouraging an unusual air, uh, air of, of collaboration and collegiality that per pervades our department and makes the free uh, exchange of help and uh, information and even equipment uh, possible within our, within our department. And so this is something at the U of I here that I think we can be justifiably proud of, uh, that we have this kind of atmosphere that helps to uh, encourage uh, the uh, progress. Now finally, to leave you with one last thought. So oh, this is our book that Dixie Whit and I wrote. Um, this is available on Amazon.com. It's overpriced, so I would rather, because uh, I'm really mad at the, at the uh, publisher about that overpricing, so I would prefer that instead of buying it from Amazon.com that you steal it. Oops. <laughs> well, I seem to have uh, committed a uh, PowerPoint uh, snafu here, so let me just go to the last. Uh, I wanted to leave you with one last little thought. Uh, it, when you think about bacteria and about antibiotic resistance, and that is, don't forget to think small. The small isn't necessarily powerless. Small can be very powerful and very dangerous. And so we need to all uh, know more about bacteria. Thank you for your attention. So I'd be happy to answer any questions people have. In many of the common products that you have now on the shelves in uh, stores are antibacterial uh, soaps, et cetera, et cetera. How do you feel about such uh, things? A, a very good one that's asked about these, are these bactericidal soaps and, and other products um, uh, a good idea or not? Uh, let me first point out that um, 
the main component of those is a, is a drug called, called triclosan that people at first thought was a disinfectant, and they now think it has more, dis, uh, more like an antibiotic. But the interesting feature of that is that um, this is something that's been in plastics, included in plastic products for a long time, because bacteria, even though they may not digest the plastic completely, they can alter its properties. And so uh, the triclosan was included. And one day, some marketing genius decided to, that, hey, if we slap a label on this cutting board that says antibacterial, now they didn't add anything, all right, that this, that this could be a, a value-added feature and what does, how does this consumer really need to know? Well, this was so popular, so they got to try this without investing any money in the idea or anything, that now they're starting to add triclosan uh, to, and, and probably soon other kinds of compounds to the, um, to the, the, the soaps and things that, where they didn't have it uh, before. Um, the first thing to, think, to realize is that the, soap, that the studies are just now starting to come out that show that for the most part, these are ineffective. That is, the good old hand washing, good old soap and water is uh, as effective. And some people, and I'm one of them, think that maybe that it's dangerous in the sense that if you uh, relax your vigilance, for example, in the kitchen, uh, because you think you have this antibacterial cutting board that's going to save you from uh, bacteria and the end of Western civilization as we know it, uh, resulting from contamination of your salad greens with your chicken, if you make you careless, that's bad. If it doesn't work, uh, then it's even, even worse. And there is some evidence beginning to appear that, that one of those uh, unknown selective, selective pressures that I mentioned may be the, some of these antibacterial compounds, that they may be in, a, in an indirect way selecting for, actually selecting for bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics and to disinfectants. And so this is a, a story that is emerging and that many of us here are interested in. But it's, um, I, I would say that if, if I don't use them, and I think it would be better if, uh, at best, they're useless, and at worst, they might be actually dangerous and over widespread use. This, this is just uh, referring to one of your slides, but you talked about over-the-counter uh, sales of uh, antibacterial uh, drugs in other countries, and I, I have seen that, mm -hmm. but I, I kind of missed your point about it, and, and maybe you could uh, name some of these drugs for us, too. Thanks. Okay. Uh, in many countries, um, the closest one being Mexico, you can buy uh, drugs like uh, penicillin, tetracycline, chloramphenicol, all the uh, commonly used antibiotics in the pharmacist. And so you can walk up and get yourself a big jar uh, to take home to do with whatever you want. And um, I, the, the reason that this, I w went over it pretty rapidly because uh, it's been discussed so much, but people were concerned about this because they think this, this indiscriminate use of antibiotics, because th there's more likelihood of a pr inappropriate use uh, would, and also you dumping it down the, down the toilet or in the river or whatever, uh, might be a pressure for selecting for antibiotic resistant bacteria. The problem, and all, there's, never, there's never a simple answer to these questions, but uh, in talking to people from developing countries where this is done, they will tell you that the reason is that they don't have a good health care system that reaches down to the people who are in the uh, lower uh, classes. And so this is their attempt to compensate for that. And if they, they claim, anyway, that if they forbade the, uh, uh, the cross-the-counter sale and forced people to go to a pharmacist, there would be this huge backlash because the drugs are pretty cheap. Now, the, there's an added problem that some of them are of very poor quality. And I know some, um, I was in Armenia uh, a couple of years ago, and they were uh, inspecting some of these drugs that they were, get, that they were getting in from some other countries um, that, that were, where they were sold across the counter, and you would be amazed at the, at the variation in quality. Some of them didn't even have any antibiotic in them, which maybe is a good thing, I don't know. But, <laughs> so this is a, but it's, I was trying to illustrate some of the many practices that we have out there, and the problem is that if you said, okay, well, how much does that contribute? I couldn't tell you, I couldn't answer it that question. And so this is something that was really more a problem of ecology. Uh, and I guess I wish more psychologists and economists and, and sociologists would get into this area because we, people like me really don't know how to do studies like that. No. 
So okay, I, Steve, this is yeah, Steve Rand, whose name was conspicuously so, missing from the list. So, so you, you had this interesting comment about, about risk assessment. I just want to ask you uh, about this issue of, uh, of kids. So, so when you and I were bringing up our kids, there were times when we had more amoxicillin in our refrigerator than we had milk, and mostly right. because of ear infections. And now there's been, a, there's been a considerable shift in what pediatricians are recommending in terms of how you treat kids with, with ear infections. I wonder if you want to make a comment on that and its efficacy and, and how you see that extending not just to ear infections but to, to other common, common infectious diseases? Starting about, uh, that's, a, that's a good question because in fact, um, starting about a decade ago, this was done before but it was, it was started most intensively, uh, people started asking questions of efficacy. So it sounds like a good idea, for example, for your, uh, if you go to a dentist and if you have a heart valve uh, implant or some other def defect in your heart valve, um, they, and you can get bacterial infections. When, when they work on your mouth, you get bacteria in the bloodstream and it can lodge in those heart valves. And so it sounds like a good idea to give somebody, give uh, antibiotics to a person of, who has that, that risk factor who's going to the dentist to give them some kind of antibiotic. The most recent studies I've seen that's just starting to come out now indicate that it's not effective. Nobody knows why. Um, there are certain other types of, similar types of use of antibiotics where physicians will give a patient antibiotics before surgery in the hopes of averting an infection, and sometimes that works well and sometimes it doesn't. So at least we're finding out, people are doing the experiment and asking which works and which doesn't. Now the earache thing uh, is, seems to be, is pretty well settled. That is that uh, the current guidelines are that uh, the, the risk from ear eggs of, of middle ear uh, damage and maybe uh, bacteria into the bloodstream and into the cerebral spinal fluid is very small and is mostly associated with infections that last more than 48 hours. So the current guideline, at least the last time I looked, was that you should not give antibiotics uh, f uh, for the first 24 to 48 hours and see if the thing resolves. Now, again, this is not, nothing as simple here. It's kind of hard to tell a parent who's sleep deprived that and especially if the parent de depends on daycare uh, and is told by the daycare people that you have to treat this infection with antibiotics before we'll allow the kid back in daycare. So there are prudent use standards that are, that are still emerging. And the problem now is to get the physicians to pay attention to them. Uh, and to, and because often it's, it's uh, just human nature that you've done something for a certain amount of time and so you just keep doing it. Uh, because, and you don't really ask whether it worked or not, but this is, a, this is a very important area of rational use that we, as we learn these things, that we transmit this information to the people who are best positioned to use it. I was fascinated by the tree of life that you put up and all the different species uh, that were represented, and then your discussion of how DNA is exchanged uh, between the bacteria, where they appear to be exchanging DNA that might be between different species, and that was something I uh, thought I had learned didn't happen. And so I'm curious in how bacteria do that and what that does for my ideas about evolution. Um, you know, one of the biggest mysteries, and it's a, it's a burning question right now, is that if you look at that tree, you ask, why are there still species? You know, if, the, if all this DNA is flying around, among, not just between different species, between different genera, um, you, and between actually different, uh, different kingdoms, I mean, Steve studies the transfer of DNA from bacteria to plant cells, which, is, which occurs naturally. So why do we have species at all? The current guess is that the answer of that. Uh, the answer to that is that there is a kind of a core of genes that are uh, very difficult, or very dangerous to change. Um, so if you start messing around with your uh, machinery for synthesizing DNA or proteins, uh, you might uh, suffer some bad consequences. Despite what I said about this being relatively risk-free for the bacteria, so some people, and Carl Woese thinks this, this is there is a core. Uh, that defines this species or that species, and that the bacteria, although they're doing this exchange, don't mess with that, or the bacteria that do mess with it get, get lost. We do know that there is a lot of that going on, uh, work in my laboratory, work in Steve's laboratory, uh, work by people who, who study soil and water organisms has proven uh, quite conclusively that there's a lot of this exchange going on. Now, a burning question for those of you who uh, like to think about things, this is titillating for you, uh, I told you that you have all those bacteroides in your intestinal tract and all those other bacteria. Are you, as we speak, being assaulted? 
<laughs> genetically by those bacteria. And nobody has, has uh, looked at the, at the bacterial, seriously looked at the bacterial to mammalian cell transfer, but it's, it's just it's something that, that we've sort of known about. Uh, and actually these exchanges, just for, for if you're interested in this, uh, I'm not talking about the exchange of a very small piece of DNA. Uh, you can exchange hundreds of kilobases, and for those of you who are not familiar with that measure, um, and this is in a single step, uh, this is, you, can, uh, uh, there's a, you can exchange almost a whole chromosome of some small bacteria, something that big, uh, in a single step. And so we're still trying to understand the consequences. Not all of those transfers uh, get set in the recipient, but uh, a lot of them do. And uh, this is, so you ask a, one of the burning questions in current microbiology. Yeah? So I wonder if you might uh, address one other area where the use of antibiotics seems to have an effect on, on health. So as we've used more antibiotics and eradicated bacteria from the environment of young children, we see that the incidence of allergy has skyrocketed. Um, do you have any insights that you might lend uh, in this as, as well? So there are recommendations that perhaps by cutting back on the inappropriate use of antibiotics, we might help reattune immune systems. That's a, that's a very interesting question. This is what's called, been called by some people the hygiene hypothesis. And it goes beyond the use of antibiotics. It goes to, to cleanliness. And so um, many people are beginning to think that, that in, well, think about the fact all that have, human evolution we've gone through. And now all of a sudden, in the last decades, we have, we have changed things quite radically. And we have changed things in two, two major ways. One is we are suddenly very clean. And so people think that the stimulation of the immune system may not be occurring the way it was the immune system was evolved to respond, so it occurs later. In fact, the people who get ulcers, uh, who get the bacteria later, are the ones who get the ulcers, whereas if they get them as ch children, they don't, they don't seem to get them. The second way we've changed, and this, this gets to be particularly creepy, but we're coming up on Halloween, um, is that in the developed countries, we have eradicated, uh, virtually eradicated worms and uh, protozoa from our intestinal tract. And there, there's a whole arm of the immune system that was evolved to respond to that. And so uh, there are those who would uh, go further uh, and say that it was that sudden, a thing that suddenly happened over the last 100, 150 years, uh, may also be a problem, and that some of these diseases may be the result of, in, uh, again, inadequate stimulation of the uh, of the immune system. So I'm looking forward to the day where you see the mother saying, Johnny, you're not going to get any dessert until you finish your dirt and worms. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's the advice, is to keep, keep your kids as dirty as possible. I mean, they're normally pretty, pretty unclean, but uh, this, is, this is something that, that more and more people believe this. And so it's, the question is how to prove it, how to prove it conclusively.